in my last video I showed how to make this support for a uh, telescoping fiberglass mast. Now I made this with the intention of using it as a uh, counterpoise for the in-fed half-wave antenna. So there's connection wires between all these support arms and there's two wires that go down the mast and connect to a ground rod uh, that's in the center of the, the PVC pipe there. So I can connect my counterpoise connection to this base and have it act as the counterpoise for the antenna. And there's a link to that video in the description below. Okay, this is uh, my MFED antenna setup, and it's made so with a tie wrap it can be attached to the fiberglass mast. And I've included a common mode choke. There's a link to a video below on how to make one of those. And that allows me to select my counterpoise rather than use the coax as the counterpoise. And uh, I've included a means of wrapping my wire up here. This is uh, roughly 30 feet of wire that uh, will go up with the extension of the mast. And the figure eight design of the winding here allows this wire to come off easily without ever being tangled. This uh, piece here goes like that and the whole mess can be pulled off and unwound without entanglement. And I'll show you how to do that. So this is uh, the conventional 49 to 1. Uh, well, some people call it an un, -un. It's basically an auto transformer. And uh, we'll get into that a little more as we go on. You note the uh, capacitors there. I used uh, two 200 picofarad capacitors in series uh, to equal the 100 picofarads that's normally connected across the input of the transformer. Now this uh, material that I used here, this uh, clear plastic, is actually PVC material. As you can see here, it's flexible. Uh, but it can be bent in a vise without heating. And uh, I use that also to mount my uh, coax connector. So it's very handy stuff. There, I get it from McMaster Car, and uh, there's a link below to uh, that material. To set up the antenna, I insert the telescoping mast into the base. And a piece of quarter-inch diameter aluminum tubing is inserted into the mast. The antenna wire will be attached to the tubing. The antenna is attached to the mast. The antenna is then attached to the counterpoise. Then I release the bundle of wire from the holder. And I walk away and unwind the wire as I do. No tangles occur due to the figure eight winding. Then the antenna wire is clipped onto the aluminum tubing and the mast is raised. Here I go to twice speed. Now with the uh, 30 feet of wire plus a quarter inch diameter aluminum tubing on the top, uh, this antenna is a, a full wave antenna on 10 meters and a uh, half wave antenna on 20 meters. Well after uh, getting the antenna up, of course I had to try it out, so I got on FT8 on 10 meters and worked in Angola. Couldn't hear a thing in the sideband portion of the band. Uh, that's the magic of FT8. Uh, I then went to 20 meters and worked a station in Hawaii and uh, continued to work other stations uh, for quite a while. So uh, 
the mode that you use uh, has a lot to do with how much power uh, you're going to dissipate in the uh, transformer. So the, the duty cycle uh, is important. And the easiest duty cycle to understand is CW. Uh, you're putting out full carrier when the key's down and uh, zero when the key's up. And according to the uh, ARRL, if you go to their RF exposure calculation instructions, uh, they give you these numbers here for duty cycles. So they're saying while you're transmitting a conversational CW, your duty cycle is 40%. Of course, normally you don't transmit continuously. Uh, let's just assume you listen about the same amount of time as you transmit. Then that duty cycle would become 20%. And uh, typically, I think you transmit even less time than you listen. A single sideband has a duty cycle of 20% without speech compression. Uh, but if you put in a lot of uh, compression, the, du the equivalent duty cycle can be as high as 50%. And then uh, the, the digital modes while transmitting, uh, it's really full carrier, so it's 100% duty cycle. But again, you're going to have off times where you listen and are not transmitting. So that would then drop down to 50% or less, depending on your on or off ratio. Now, FT8 has a specific cycle. It transmits for 13 seconds. Then there's a two-second off time for decoding and time synchronizations. And then it receives for 15 seconds and then repeats. So every 30 seconds, it transmits 13 seconds. So that's a duty cycle of 43%. So I was on FT8 at full power, 100 watts is what I have. And uh, after a while, I noticed uh, my SWR going up. It, uh, it, in about a half hour, uh, it creeped up to 1.3. Now, it didn't start creeping right away. It was after I had been operating for about a half hour. I noticed it then start to creep up. So I went outside and felt the uh, core, and it was nice and hot. So uh, the next step was to put a thermocouple on it so I could actually measure the temperature. Here's my setup for measuring temperature. The wire to the right is a uh, thermocouple wire. It's in contact with the core material. This toroid here is a common mode choke to keep RF out of the uh, thermocouple meter. And the field strength meter is so that uh, I can tell when the power is on and off. Two of my videos are listed below on thermocouples and thermocouple meters, if you're interested. And I have here a uh, data book put out by Amadon. Uh, back in the year 2000, it was $15, and I don't think it's available anymore, but this had reams of data available uh, about ferrite materials. And for the 43 material, uh, this curve is in there. Well, the first part of it I've added beyond 100 degrees C here, I've added. Now, as I said earlier, I began to see my SWR change at about 80 degrees C. Uh, by, by the way, this is uh, impedance of a coil wound on 43 mix. And uh, this is 25 degrees C, which is room temperature. 100 degrees C, of course, is boiling water. And I've added this uh, 130 degrees C is the Curie temperature of uh, the 43 mix. So at that point, the permeability goes away. So at, at 100 degrees C, uh, the impedance has dropped by 30%. It's only 70% of the original at 100 degrees C. And I began to notice something happening at 80 degrees C. So if uh, the temperature keeps going up and the impedance keeps coming down, we essentially have a thermal runaway condition. So uh, 
You can operate this mix at a particular power level for quite a while and then thermal runaway is going to set in and you're going to have to retune after every transmission or uh, shut off for a while and let things cool down. So the premise of this video was how many watts is a uh, NFET half wave using this core good for? Now this uh, is an FB240-43. The 240 tells you that it's 2.4 inches in diameter and that it's made from the 43 material. And as we already mentioned, uh, the amount of watts we dump in here has to do with what mode we're operating on. And also then your style of operation. Are you a rag chewer, or a DX chaser? Uh, you know, are you a net control operator? Uh, that'll have a lot to do with uh, how much power you can put in here and for how long. Now another thing that uh, nobody seems to talk about is cooling. Uh, how do we cool this thing? Uh, what I showed with my setup, uh, I hit, my transformer was essentially in open air. Uh, there was a breeze and uh, it only lasts uh, about a half an hour uh, operating uh, FT8 uh, before it begins to overheat. So the cooling is uh, a pretty important thing that we don't talk about. Now if you take this and wrap it all up in tape and put it in a plastic box uh, where you can't get rid of any heat, uh, it's not even going to last as long. So, uh, you know, this is a power transistor. Uh, what wattage is that good for? Well, maybe one watt like this. Uh, we put it on a heat sink, maybe uh, it's good for five watts. If we put it on a bigger heat sink and fan cool it, uh, maybe uh, it's good for 20 watts. So cooling is uh, an important thing. So think about that when you're putting together uh, your NFED half wave. As you look at videos on uh, how to build the NFED half wave, uh, you'll see people stacking multiple cores. And what that does is uh, distribute the flux between the two cores so that theoretically you could go to a higher power level and be dumping the same wattage in each core. But also notice you lose some of your cooling area. This face and this face, when we put them together, uh, they're no longer uh, getting rid of heat. So you do get some additional heat uh, surface, but you also lose some. So you can't assume it's proportional to stacking up cores. Now there's uh, another problem with ferrite cores that I haven't seen anybody talk about. And uh, that subject uh, deserves its own video. So I plan to uh, make another video right after this one uh, describing another problem uh, that you may not want to build one of these uh, NFED half-wave antennas with ferrite cores. So if you don't want to miss that video, be sure and subscribe.